Good morning. Uh, all of us know that we are going through uh, again the third wave of pandemic and uh, we have been very happy if we have met personally and try to interact each other but unfortunately uh, it's not possible so we have to go online and uh, let me uh, uh, tell you the today's uh, my topic is uh, year and review of the 2021 it will be divided into the part one and part two today i am going to cover the part one in this particular uh, presentation i would uh, try to cover the uh, major happenings in a stroke or head injury seizure and spinal injury I, I was surprised. I thought that uh, because of the pandemic and because of the uh, every uh, healthcare system was overburdened with the COVID, uh, whether I will get the, uh, good interesting articles regarding the, these particular topics in the neurocritical care. But let me tell you to my surprise, uh, I, I, I received, uh, I, I just able to search the few which are really going to have an impact on our clinical practice. It is going to help us at the bedside. And uh, definitely it will add on value while practicing in a neurocritical care. So the first topic is a stroke. Now, this document, which is a, a quite lengthy document, detailed document, but a good evidence-based document, European Stroke Organization Guidelines on Intravenous Thrombolysis for Acute Ischemic Stroke. They, they, have, um, they have created the document which is uh, evidence-based, which is the expert-based opinion. Sometimes evidence is much more in favor of the certain things, but sometimes expert might uh, have some difference of opinion. But overall, this document is one of the good document for referring for the uh, stroke thrombolysis uh, in acute ischemic stroke. So what this document says that these are the uh, guidelines for acute ischemic stroke. These are the guidelines for acute ischemic stroke. So if the acute ischemic stroke, anyone presents with the acute ischemic stroke less than 4.5 hour duration and not eligible for thrombectomy by uh, clinical criteria, then they suggest please go ahead with the thrombolysis with alteplase. On the other hand, if someone is presenting within 4.5 hours, he has a large vessel occlusion on the perfusion studies, then intravenous thrombolysis is considered before the thrombectomy and they suggest the intravenous thrombolysis with the tinic replacement. Now, why difference is in between the th th before th if somebody is not eligible for thrombectomy and somebody is eligible for the thrombectomy? Uh, if he is not eligible for thrombectomy, alteplase is a choice. But if he is a large vessel, then uh, choice of the drug is tinic replacement. The reason is very clear. Tinic replacement is a fibrin specific. And tinic replacement is a long-acting uh, fibrolytic. So generally, in a large vessel disease, they suggest before the uh, thrombectomy, you go ahead with the tinic replace. So that, that's what the um, evidence uh, in favor of the these both drugs. But both drugs are acceptable for the stroke thrombolysis. If somebody is coming with the uh, awakening uh, from the sleep and the stroke, this is typical uh, wake-up stroke, then they suggest the interventricular thrombectomy before mechanical thrombectomy. So please, whatever the evidence till now, till 2021, they are saying that kid, you thrombolyze the patient first and then go for the mechanical thrombectomy rather than rushing towards the uh, mechanical thrombectomy. The fourth category they have uh, explained the minor stroke but disabilitating stroke within, uh, within 4.5 hours, then intravenous thrombolysis is ultimate. Sometimes what happens, uh, there is a mild weakness, NHS score is uh, one or two, but patient is having some weakness or slurpees or aphasia. And if it is progressive, then you, you should con uh, consider the, uh, intravenous thrombolysis in this particular category. Now, next category, uh, if the acute ischemic stroke of the 4.5 to 9 hour duration, that's what the now uh, we are targeting the, those strokes who are coming after 4.5 hours. But if you are a center where the no brain imaging facilities are available uh, for the perfusion as well as the MR angio or CT angio, uh, please don't rush for the thrombolysis. So what do you mean by that? If at all you want to thrombolyze the this perfusion mismatch or uh, clinical perfusion mismatch, uh, this thing that means the 4.5 hour to 9 hour duration, then CT and MRI core perfusion mismatch is must. If you do not have the facility, please do not thrombolize. If you have facility, document it, 
and then go for the uh, this thing so what what are the criteria for uh, uh, going ahead with the uh, thrombolysis in this patient is the infarct core volume less than 70 critically hypoperfuse volume uh, ac uh, against the infarct core volume more than 1.2 mismatch volume more than 10 ml and th this is where you can uh, do the perfusion studies to document that this patient may or may not be uh, ideal candidate for uh, thrombolysis after 4.5 hours till 9 hours. So once you remember when we are thrombolyzing and when we are not thrombolyzing. Now, uh, nowadays, the most of the patients are on the NOVAC. A newer anticoagulation. And if they come within 4.5 hours, then it's very tricky situation again you have to uh, take a call case by case but they suggest that this, there is no e sufficient evidence available for uh, thermalizing uh, these patients for 48 hours next category generally platelet count we do not do the platelet count or we should not wait for the platelet count in the patients who are coming in the window period but if someone comes with the uh, acute ischemic stroke within window period but is low platelet count known platelet count is less than one lakh then please avoid intravenous thrombolysis. So again, please note it. We uh, they have not suggesting that you should do the platelet and wait for the platelet count and then go for the thrombolysis. No, but if someone comes with the low platelet, then this is not the ideal candidate for the thrombolysis. Now, uh, if someone comes with the acute ischemic stroke less than 4.5 hours duration with history of the stimulation migraine infarction more than one week to three months. Then uh, again, the consensus say that uh, you can go ahead with the thrombolysis. And in acute ischemic stroke, less than 4.5 hours duration with a clear or suspected diagnosis of the infective endocarditis, there one should not go ahead with the thrombolysis. So I think most of the gray areas and most of the uh, dilemmas about the uh, thrombolysis in uh, stroke uh, uh, has been very uh, clear in this particular document uh, on the evidence base. Now, this was another study. If you, if you carefully see that uh, in, in the uh, blood pressure management in hemorrhagic stroke, up till now we are talking about the acute ischemic stroke. Here we are talking about hemorrhagic stroke. Now, intracanal hemorrhage is always associated with the high mortality and morbidity. And lowering the systolic blood pressure with an intravenous antihypertensive such as nicardipine or clavidipine, uh, they, they may reduce the risk of the hematoma expansion and re-bleeding. Previous studies comparing the nicardipine and clavidipine in the patients with the stroke found no significant uh, blood pressure uh, difference. So they try to compare again uh, this particular uh, drug. These are the uh, available and these are the uh, choice of the uh, antihypertensive drugs in the hemorrhagic stroke. So head to head comparison, uh, though it was a single central retrospective study, but it was a quite good uh, randomized study where they compare the uh, clavidipine and uh, nicadipine in terms of the mortality, in terms of uh, uh, whether they need the, any additional antihypertensive along with the drugs to reduce the uh, blood pressure. What was the total volume of expansion? What was the length of ICU stay? What was the hospital length of stay? And what was the cost? If you see the p-values uh, regarding the need of antihypertensive stay, there is no statistically significant in between the these two drugs in adon to n comparison. But in in terms of the total volume of infusion, uh, nicardipine uh, is uh, slightly higher. It requires the uh, fourteen ten versus three thirty, uh, which is statistically significant. But in terms of the ICU length of stay and hospital length of stay, uh, it is not significantly uh, this thing. But the major thing, cost. Uh, Nicardipine is much cheaper as compared to the uh, clavidipine. And further, what they test in, in the uh, further comparison, uh, whether the control of the blood pressure less than systolic blood pressure less than 120 and mean blood pressure less than 90, there is no major difference in between the two drugs. But in terms of the rebound hypertension and bradycardia, uh, I think nicardipine uh, has uh, age over the clavidipine. So uh, there are less number of the patients who are observed in a nicardipine group with the rebound hypertension and bradycardia. And that is what observed in this head-to-head -head comparison in between the nicardipine and uh, clavidipine in management of the acute hemorrhagic stroke. 
so nicotinine appears to be associated with similar time of the goals of the systemic blood pressure as well as the percentage of time at the goal compared with the clearedepin so there is no there is no uh, comparative difference in terms of the efficacy of lowering the blood pressure systolic as well as the mean blood pressure <laughs> there is no significant difference in need for additional antihypertensive agent already i explained rebleeding hematoma expansion length of stay in hospital length of stay in icu readmission mortality there was no significant difference in between the both uh, group however clearedepin has significantly less uh, total volume administration in terms of the infusion other way round nicotinine appears to results in a significantly less rebound hypertension less bradycardia and reduced cost compared to the clearedepin so now choice is with us it is very clearly um, uh, differentiated from this uh, particular single center retrospective not a very large number of the uh, patients were involved but still it gives us a good age on comparison in between the two drugs and uh, we can say we can uh, convincingly say that the, both drugs are effective in lowering the blood pressure but in terms of the rebound hypertension and the other complications like bradycardia and the cost nicotinine has a slightly age over the clearedepin now next next is a uh, this is a ultra trial this ultra trial is a uh, use of the early uh, transamic acid early transamic acid now uh, every one of us know that the transamic acid has previously been thought to be the wonder drug in terms of bleeding but many recent negative studies looking at the effectiveness of the uh, transamic created the doubt like a crash to or uman or t2 except these studies have created a doubt about the particular this effect then uh, everyone knows that the, when we talk about the sh the uh, our first concern is rebleeding within 24 hours then uh, expansion of the hematoma and there, there is a, a catastrophic events happens during the sh so we all are concerned regarding the management of sh in you know, the first 24 hours and they are they are, they are more prone for the complication on the other hand in the same group of the sh we are worried about those who are more prone to developing the delayed cerebral uh, ischemia which can lead to the poor clinical outcome so while using uh, uh, early transamic acid like uh, within 3 hours of the sh which is a ct prone sh uh, one need to keep the both things in the mind we are we are concerned about the rebleeding but simultaneously we are concerned about the, those patients who might uh, have a tendency of developing the delayed uh, ischemia and they landed with the spasm and which may give uh, may get worsen with the transamic acid so what this study says basically it was a good uh, randomized study uh, the computerized generalized allocation was done but it was a non blinded uh, total 950 patients were analyzed in uh, uh, control as well as the transamic group and further to uh, study uh, the most important part of the this study one should uh, aware that what are the exclusion criteria since you are using the transamic acid the one should know that it should be the ct proven uh, this thing but simultaneously traumatic sh has been uh, excluded from the this studies those who are with the hypercoagulate stage should not be included in this studies pregnancy or creatinine more than 1.5 or those who are documented dvt or p or on treatment should not be included because we don't want the complication associated with the uh, transamic acid uh, so uh, what they did uh, they comparatively uh, 480 patients in a transamic acid group compared with the 475 control group and in uh, trial group that is intervention group they have given a one gram bolus followed by one gram eight hourly and followed them for the uh, 24 hours now the most important part of the, this thing they haven't looked for the bleed they 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 uh, went ahead with a good clinical outcome at the end of the uh, 30 day icu mortality and uh, six months so it was a more of the clinical oriented trial rather than uh, only uh, rebleeding part and they have found that there is no statistic significance uh, difference in between the intervention as well as the placebo or the control group in terms of mortality at 30 day mortality at 90 days as well as the modifier and score at the end of the six months so this, this study if you see uh, the strength of this study is it is a randomized well designed and uh, uh, the powered clinical outcome they, they haven't gone by the re-bleeding it was a power, power to be the clinical outcome that are the uh, uh, 
uh, you can say the strength of the, this uh, particular study. But however, the weakness is it is unblended study. So investigator has a choice to select the patient. Probably it may uh, have the, some pro uh, bias in selection of the patient and convenient sample size uh, one can uh, choose uh, out of this. So uh, this study is a negative study where it is clearly uh, documented transamic acid treatment in early uh, part of the SH patients does not help in improving the clinical outcome at the six months, uh, which was measured by the modifier and Cisco score. Now, uh, this was about the stroke. Up till now, we have seen what are the new thing about the stroke. Now, regarding the head injury. Now, fluid balance and outcome in critically ill patients. This was another uh, prospective multicenter comparative uh, study I came across. And then all of us know that the fluid management in acute brain injury, and there is a quite good evidence is available regarding the uh, fluid management and the uh, adverse effect of the positive fluid balance in acute brain injury. This study was particularly uh, done in a severe traumatic uh, brain injury uh, patient where we can uh, see the fluid balance. What they have done, uh, they have the, seen the uh, total number of the patients were 4,500. And they have, uh, out of that, the final group of the uh, patients available was the 2,000 plus. They have done the two things. They have calculated the median mean daily fluid input, uh, this thing, which was 1.4 liter in uh, study group. And simultaneously, they have uh, found out the mean daily fluid balance. So daily fluid intake as well as the daily fluid balance, which was a 0.8. And they compare it in the clinical. Again, this was a clinical outcome related uh, study where in acute traumatic injury, where they have a uh, comparison of the positive fluid balance. And when they uh, <coughs> comparison, the uh, positive fluid balance has a uh, adverse effect on the ICU mortality, as well as the mean daily output uh, has an adverse effect on the mortality. So uh, acute brain injury, whether it is an acute traumatic injury, again, it is proven that you need to be uh, very uh, much alert while giving the fluid in this patient. Every day you calculate the fluid intake, fluid balance, and see that uh, they are either euolemic uh, or they should not be the hypervolumic. So in summary, this particular trial teaches a lot of things. The fluid management of the patient in traumatic brain injury in ICU varies substantially between the centers with positive fluid balance associated with the worst outcome. I'm quite sure in India, most of the, uh, most of the centers are very aggressive with the fluids uh, uh, from day one. Then this particular study results So uh, in summary, if you see the fluid management patients with the traumatic brain injury in the ICU, very substantially between the centers with the positive fluid balance associated with the worst outcome. And one should know that kit together with the existing evidence, this result suggests that aiming for the mean neutral balances is more rigorously. Avoiding the both hypervolemia and hypovolemia could improve the clinical outcome in our practice. And adhering to the personal approaches when appropriate, such as the, those guided by the routine, use hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, now, the next uh, one is regarding the effect of the continuous infusion of the hypertonic saline versus standard care at the six months neurological outcome in patients with the traumatic brain injury. Now, all of us know that the patient with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury can suffer damage due to the secondary brain injury. And if the intracranial hypertension due to the intracranial swelling follow the initial injury can result in the damaged brain tissue. So, we are, whether this, this trial was aiming with 
if we start prophylactic uh, early uh, infusion of the hypotonic saline, uh, continuous hypotonic saline within 24 hours of the traumatic brain injury, whether it helps to prevent the rise in uh, uh, ICD. This this was a, a concept uh, with this trial. Uh, if you see the uh, this trial setting, the nine uh, French hospitals were selected, and from November 2017 to 2020, they have gone through. Inclusion criteria was the 18 to 18 year, 80 years of the patients they have included and admitted in ICU moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. Exclusion is as uh, like what you they said, the pregnancy or associated cervical cord injury. They have uh, this thing. Now, when they compare in a, uh, 393 patients uh, out of that 185 randomized to the hypotonic saline, within 24 hours after the trauma, one hour bolus infusion was injected immediately after the randomization and con continuous infusion of the 20% hypotonic saline was administered and adapted to the patient's serum sodium level targeted in between 155. That's what the study design uh, they have followed. And again, the, this trial was aiming at the clinical outcome. And the clinical outcome, if you see in between the initial and the control group, there is no major added uh, advantage in terms of the extended Glasgow Coma Scale at the uh, six months. So this was again negative trial. Even if you try the prophylactic uh, hypotonic infusion within 24 hours, to prevent the rise in ICP and further worsening because of the secondary injury to the brain, then uh, probably uh, we uh, we are not doing the uh, right thing in this particular patient. So what are the question raised by uh, this particular trial? What is the effect of the continuous infusion of the hypotonic saline in patient with traumatic pain injury? And what, what is the results? Among the patient with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, treatment with continuous infusion of the 20% hypotonic saline compared with the standard care which we follow did not result significantly better neurological status. So the, uh, what we practice, we should continue. There is no role of the prophylactic continuous infusion of the hypotonic saline in moderate severe to traumatic brain injury. Now, the third part is uh, of this particular uh, presentation is uh, uh, seizures, that is epilepsy. Now, all of us know that uh, sodium valparate is a drug of choice uh, for the uh, newly diagnosed generalized and classified epilepsy. But now, after the emergence of the levetiracetam, uh, everyone uh, using is left and right. And simultaneously, sodium valparate has some side effect in the pregnancy. Generally, the pregnant lady, because of the its uh, uh, adverse effect, don't prefer to uh, we do not prefer to prescribe the valparate. This was the first trial head to head with the sodium valparate versus levetiracetam in uh, terms of the cost effectiveness for the newly diagnosed generalized unclassified epilepsy. This was an open label, non infinity, multi central phase four trial. And let's find out what this trial suggests. Uh, if you see the Senate identifies the, when they did the Senate the one, that is the, the part one of this study, they have identified that the sodium valparate as a first line treatment that it was superior to the uh, rest of the uh, lamotrigine for seizure control and superior to the even topiramate for the treatment failure. Valparate was superior to the even carbamazifium, topiramate, as well as the phenobarbital in the, for the treatment failure. However, the Senate 2 is the only trial that is provided the much needed head to head data for the long term effectiveness of the Walpurus versus leverage domain. And they have found that uh, Walpurus should be continued as a first line uh, treatment in uh, generalized onset uh, seizures. However, the omens of the childbearing potential leverage domain was inferior to the Walpurus as in Lamotrigin. But some women might prefer the drugs with the greater efficacy, notwithstanding the risk of the teratogenicity. So now this, this SANA2 trial gives a very clear idea about the uh, utility of the sodium valparate in management of the, as a first line uh, uh, drug for uh, particularly the seizures as compared to the uh, levitisamide. Now, this was a, another good study I have observed from the European Journal of Epilepsy is a prevention of seizure occurrence 
following the spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage and it was a uh, quite a good systemic review and metal analysis of the seizure prophylaxis in a uh, IC bleed they have observed and when they gone through the so many studies like uh, from 2002 to 2020 uh, the quite good sample size patients were included and they have gone through the uh, every part of, of the this IC bleed and whether you are uh, prophylactic uh, anticonvulsions has any role in prevention of seizure. But if you see, uh, they, are, they are not, in neither they are favorable, not they are against. So there is no uh, favorable outcome in terms of preventing the seizures in spontaneous uh, intercanal hemorrhage. So the conclusion of this good uh, meta-analysis is that Seizure prophylaxis in adult patients with spontaneous ICS did not prevent seizure occurrence. Most studies included in this systemic analysis and the review and meta-analysis were observational studies. Future high-quality studies, including the randomized controlled trials and trials evaluating the patients with the more serious ICS are still needed. But whatever the evidence available in current situation is not in favor of uh, starting the anticonvulsions for prevention of uh, seizure in spontaneous ICS, this particular uh, meta-analysis. And coming to the uh, last part of the uh, year and review, the spinal injuries, the influence of a timing of the surgical uh, decompression in acute lung, uh, acute spinal injury, the pool analysis of the individual daughter. This was another beautiful paper. See what happened? Uh, all of us know that there is a dilemma since years. Ki, oh, what is the uh, ideal timing for surgical uh, decompression in acute spinal injuries. Uh, few are in fear of the uh, early, few are in a late, and still dilemma goes. And there is not a good sufficient evidence was available till now in terms of uh, benefit. This particular, uh, they have, they have come, pool analysis, they have uh, done from the uh, quite uh, effective studies like uh, uh, NACT and uh, spinal cord injury registry. So they, they have derived the data from the four studies, which was the uh, which was the reliable, uh, randomized, and uh, very effective uh, data collection. It was uh, these four uh, selected studies. They have pulled the data and they did the analysis, and they have done the analysis uh, comparison of the late surgery versus early. Now they have defined the early surgery as within 24 hours. On what basis they have decided uh, this early surgery within 24 hours has not been explained. Might be what is the role of the ultra early like within uh, 12 hours is also the questionable. But generally uh, they have compared the less than 24 hours or more than 24 hours. And when they gone through the uh, various uh, effects of the spinal cord injuries like uh, total motor score, light touch score, pinprick score, and the grading. And what they found in from the, this uh, pool analysis of the major studies, the early uh, intervention within 24 hours is in favor of gaining the motor score. Generally, they found that upper limb motor power at the end of the uh, few weeks or months is uh, more improvement as compared to the lower limb power. Then light and touch score, again, early group, it is infavorable. Pinprick score is again early group, it is uh, infavorable. And uh, the uh, uh, AIS grading is also uh, better in early uh, group of the surgeries. And again, if you see the statistically uh, significant, the change in the total more score, early surgeries are statistically significant. Change in the light touch score is statistically significant. Change in the pin prick score is uh, significant. And overall uh, AIS grade is again the significant. So uh, with conclusion, this was a really good uh, pull data. And now there is some evidence is available in favor of the uh, early uh, surgery that is the timing of the uh, decompression surgery is acute spinal injuries and this particular pool analysis found that the surgical comp decompression within 24 hours is associated with the superior sensory uh, motors recovery at the uh, one year uh, follow the immediate 24 to 36 hours following the injury a crucial time window wherein reducing the delay in decompressive surgery could improve the neurological outcome that is again the extended 
After 36 hours, opportunity to modulate the recovery with the time of the decompression might be lost probably because of the irreversible tissue injury. So uh, uh, we need uh, additional uh, uh, information. And the, the problem with this particular pool analysis is uh, they have seen early within 24 hours. Again, the, uh, this was for, though it is a randomized, there might be the selection bias. It, it is from the one country only. So we are not, uh, there is a, um, there's a, some issue with the uh, external validity. And uh, there are so many other things are concerned. But one should simultaneously keep on the back of the mind that those who are unstable patients, those who are in a shock or those who are clinically morbid patients are not candidate for this particular uh, intervention, uh, like early 24 hours, uh, this thing. So don't get carried away with the, this particular pool analysis. But now there is some documentary evidence in favor of the early decompressive uh, surgeries in uh, acute spinal injuries. And the last uh, quickest part of the uh, this particular presentation is the timing of the tracheostomy. All of us always debate what is the uh, timing of the tracheostomy in uh, acute brain injury as well as in a uh, uh, traumatic spinal cord injury. And this particular uh, analysis gives us a, a much broader aspect of the uh, early tracheostomy. And what they have, they have again, uh, tachostomy is an intervention. It cannot be uh, compared in terms of the mortality. Mortality is because of the underlying decision. So primary outcome, though it is a short-term mortality, which is not statistically significant. But in terms of the, if you say the duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, incidence of the VAP and the tachostomy related complication, it definitely adds uh, in favor of the early tachostomy in a uh, traumatic spinal injury. So one should not look at the tachostomy as any benefit towards the mortality. There are so many other uh, benefits in terms of the early tachostomy. So early tachostomy within seven days of uh, injury, in acute spinal injury, reduces the uh, mechanical ventilation duration, I reduces the ICU and hospital length of stay, prevents the VAP, and also reduces the uh, tachostomy related complication. However, early tachostomy was not associated with the decrease in short term mortality, which is anticipated. Thank you.